James in your Bible, if you want, turn with me to the book of James. The next part of our six things is the lying tongue. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue is where we're at. To begin in our study about the lying tongue, first let's get a grasp of what the tongue even is. James chapter 3, and in verse 3, the Bible reads, Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which, though they be so great, and are driven with fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is, it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea, is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive trees? Either can a vine figs. So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. We see very quickly the description of the tongue. It's not a pleasant one. It's not a, it's not a lifting up of the tongue. It's not a member that gets much credit as a, something that is good. I noticed this even as I was reading it. In verse 7 it says, For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. Every kind. And we think about all of the different beasts that are living in this world, and the Bible records that they have been and have been tamed by mankind, and yet the tongue here, as a fire, as a world of iniquity, as an unruly evil that's full of deadly poison, can no man tame. Verse 8 says that, the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. There it's used to bless and to curse at the same time. And how can we bless the God while cursing men who are made after the similitude of God? It's interesting to note this because men cannot tame it. Though we have tamed bees, we have tamed birds and serpents, we've used them to our own advantage. We've tamed them and brought them into subjection unto us. The tongue, in contrast, can no man tame. We're blessing or we're cursing with it. There's truth or there's lies coming out of it. And, and the difference being in the situation is whether or not we're yielding them to God to use for their, His will or we're yielding it to our own flesh to use it for our will. And the Bible here says, can no man tame? I think that leaves to be accepted the fact that the only thing, the only one, the only power great enough to tame man's tongue is God Himself. So we ought to be aware of this. We ought to know that the tongue is great danger. It's the fire. It's the world of iniquity. It's that unruly evil. The Bible records it as a poison. John chapter 8. If you would, turn with me to John chapter 8. And you're going to find the tongue as it has been used in the past. For lies. And that's what we're talking about. The lying tongue is one of these six things that the Lord doth hate. And it's no wonder when you read John chapter 8, the beginning in verse 42, why this would be so. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. 
The father, the root, the offspring is us. The tongue comes from a place that was begotten of the devil himself. That lying tongue, the root of it, the source of it is the devil. He is the father of it. He is speaking lies for he is a liar and the father of those that do such. Using our tongues to speak lies, to speak falsehoods, to speak wickedness. But we need to be careful because this is not one of those situations where we can just be, oh, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. He's the father of lies. He's the father of my tongue. And when I lie, it's only because the devil made me do it. When I, when I tell untruths, when I fib, when I exaggerate, it's only because the devil made me do it. And though he is the root of it, though he is the father of it all, we cannot blame him. Why? Because the tongue is but flesh. If we know anything about the flesh, we know that the flesh is more than capable of sinning in and of itself. It does not need the help of the devil. Look, the devil's not omnipresent. He isn't everywhere at once. He is not always on your shoulder whispering over your back and telling you to do wrong. Your flesh is more than capable. The devil's only in one place at one time. And what arrogance do we have when we say, oh, the devil made me do it? Like he has nothing better to do in this world that he is causing turmoil in as he tries to lead about the end of days when he will eventually usurp the authority of God and take over the world. When we say, the devil made me do it, we're saying that the devil has nothing better to do. Don't you think he's probably got business in the White House? Don't you think he's probably got business in Parliament Hill? Don't you think he's probably got business in, in the, the Queen's Palace? Don't you think he's probably got bigger business, bigger fish to fry than just to make you tell a lie? Absolutely he does. Our flesh is, our tongue is flesh and more than capable of sinning in and of itself. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1, if you would. 1 Timothy chapter 1. <clears throat> the Bible records this thing, saying in Romans. It says, let God be true, but every man a liar. Let God be true, but every man a liar. And that is the truth, is that all have sinned in that area of lying. What do we do when we want to lead somebody to the Lord and convince them that they're a sinner? We take them to Revelation. We show them that one lie is all that is needed to send somebody to hell. And nobody can deny even telling one little white lie throughout their life and therefore condemned by it. Let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written. So every man, like it or not, we are all trapped in condemnation, in judgment that applies to this hatred of the lying tongue. We have all done it, right from when we are little and we grow up. It's simply within our nature to do so. That lying tongue, God hates. 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 8, the Bible reads, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners. For unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Condemned by it. We're convinced. We're, we're lined up when we tell lies, and that lying tongue takes a hold of our flesh and uses itself to cause poison, that deadly venom that comes out of it every time we spew those lies. We're convinced among some of the most wicked of sins. You see that right here. We see murderers of mothers, murderers of fathers, whoremongers, and that defile themselves with mankind, the female equivalent of the whoremonger. We see that perjured persons, and any other thing all encapsulates and walks with the sin of lying. And we're convinced. We're not only convinced of that, if you have the Holy Spirit in your heart right now, you know that you've lied and you have been corrected by that. Perhaps that was even used in the gospel presentation that was given to you that, um, that caused you to realize that you're a sinner and to move further down the Roman road. But regardless of the fact, we are all connected within that same convicted state where we are judged as liars. We are judged as using a lying tongue, and that is something that God hates. And this isn't, I believe, just a matter of telling stories or telling little fibs or telling exaggerations upon stories that, that were true. Lying also comes into play when our actions do not reflect the words that come out of our mouth. What is that known as? It's hypocrisy, right? 
When our actions aren't in line with what comes out of our mouth, that is another form of lying. That is the lying tongue prophesying over yourself, preaching of your own self that you are a hypocrite. You are trapped within that, that web of the lies that you spin. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2 says this, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and hast for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. These tried those that said they were apostles with their mouth and found that they were not. And how did they do it? I believe because their works weren't present. This is not having to do necessarily with being saved or with being lost. But when somebody claims to be an apostle, they are claiming there's a certain amount of application to their Christian walk. In other words, they know something in their head and they do it. I'm an apostle. I am applying the scriptures as I hear them and walking in those truths. The context here says, I know thy works. I know thy labor. I know thy patience. And then it says, you have tried those that say with their mouths they're apostles, but they are not. And continues and says, you have borne, you have patience, you have labored and have not fainted. These were lying. They were found to be liars because they were saying they were living the Christian life. They were saying they were doing the works meet for the master's use. They were fitting in with the application of the salvation that was given them. They were one with those that labored and went forth and did righteousness according to the commandments of God. But it was revealed by trial that they were not. They were found to be liars and therefore hypocrites because they said something but did another thing. So maybe these were saved. And maybe not. And if not, then they would have the application applied to them near the end of Revelation that we use all the time when we go so and when we say, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire. Again, that connects lying, that lying tongue, the hatred of God that he has towards us with many wicked sins, including sorcery, adultery, murder, all these drunken revelings. They all go and are part and parcel with lying. We tend to downplay lying, don't we? Whoso maketh a lie, is what the Bible continues on, just to make sure the point is put forward. Well, you know, I've told a lie, a lie, but I'm not necessarily a liar. Well, that's not true, because if you make one, you shall have your part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. The Bible is clear on this. But if this group is saved, and if it's just a matter that they are speaking words and just not doing them, and they're just getting trapped in this web of hypocrisy, if they are saved, this does not make the, command, uh, the, the condemnation of God any less severe in this life. They are still judged and found within the realm of the tongue that God hateth. They possess that same tongue that God hateth. They are lying, and God hates that lying tongue. It's abomination. So our hypocrisy our fibbing, our exaggerations, the way that we try to weave our way out of things by telling half-truths, that's all within the realm and is all within the focus of God's hatred. He hates the lying tongue. There's no way of getting away from this. We need to take that and apply it to ourselves. How often do we find ourselves doing those exact things, just, just little white lies, just little untruths, just little ways that we kind of manipulate situations in order to cover our own selves, make ourselves seem less guilty in the situation? Lying is essentially an act of self-preservation. It's trying to esteem yourself above others and maintain that standard. You try to weave a web. You try to manipulate a situation. You try to steer the blame from you because you're trying to preserve yourself. The truth doesn't need preservation. There we don't, therefore, we don't need to lie if we are walking in the truth. And Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. He says, come unto me, right? He wants us to follow in his footsteps. He set forth that example. And that example had nothing to do. There was no place for the lying tongue. And yet the Christians too often have that in their lives. Turn to Romans chapter 6. 
So what's our solution to this? How, how do we escape this, this idea of the lying tongue? How do we stop that tongue from speaking lies, from uttering lies, from, from getting away from us, from slipping up? Romans chapter 6 spells it out very nicely. In verse 12, Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God and those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So what do you need to do with that member, with that tongue, with that poison of ash, with that fire, with that world of iniquity, with that unruly evil that abides in your mouth? What do you need to do with it in order to restrict it and to restrain it. Well, the Bible says no man can tame it. Man has done great things, like I said, to tame all beasts of the earth, right? But they cannot tame their own tongue. Who can tame the tongue? God. The only one that's going to contain the tongue is God. The only one that's going to restrain your tongue is God. But as with everything in this life, God just doesn't take a hold of it, tie hands behind the back and say, this is how you're going to do it. You need to give yieldedness to him. You need to give him permission, essentially, to take your <coughs> tongue and to use it for his glory. Just like this verse says, don't yield your members unto sin. Don't yield your members unto the lust that they should be obeyed. Right? You need to not yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. In other words, just allowing unrighteousness, allowing your lust to take hold. You can't just allow your tongue to run wild and just say that, oh, you know, that's just how I was raised. When I, you, know, you can't just let your tongue run and just say, oh, well, that's just my flesh. Or just say, oh, that, Satan made me do it. No, you need to take that and understand that it is an unruly evil and say, God, my tongue is wicked. It always does wrong. It always does is saying lies, is always speaking lies and untruths, and you say, God, take hold of my tongue and use it for your will. Just as the hammer would be used to drive nails, it's an instrument, right? It's a tool. You take your tongue and say, God, use my tongue as an instrument in your hand to produce righteousness, to do righteous things. This is the only way that we're ever going to hold down, pin down, nail down the tongue, and keep it from lying. Keep it from doing the things that God hates. That's the solution. Yield your tongue unto the Father. Yield your tongue unto God. Go to James, if you would. James chapter 1. Hypocrisy. The next idea of the lying tongue. The, the idea that my tongue is saying something that my body isn't doing. It's writing checks that I can't cash, right? It, your tongue is telling one story and your actions are telling a different story and that is hypocrisy. Well, how do we keep our tongue from lying in that area? It's simple. If you say it, do it. If you say it, do it. James chapter 1 talks about this. James chapter 1 and verse 21. It said, For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lie, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. So this is saying, lay aside the filthiness, lay aside the superfluity, superfluity of naughtiness. In other words, just the nothingness, the, the idea that you have extra naughtiness, extra nothing in your life. So lay it aside, close the gaps, receive with meekness rather that engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But it says this, it's great to hear preaching, it's great to read your Bible, it's great to do all of these things, but that's not enough for the Christian. Verse 22, but be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And that's the hypocrisy, that's the Hippocratic attitude when you take on the scriptures. When you are studying, when you are reading, when you are absorbing the scriptures, you're hearing the preaching, you're learning lots about the Bible, but you're not practically acting it out. You're just like those in Revelation chapter 2, where they are saying they're apostles, but they are not. They're rubbing elbows with the apostles. They're, all, they're at all the meetings. They're going to the services. They're 
appearing to do all the right things, but when they're tried, they are found liars. And that's what happens when we receive the engrafted word that is able to save our souls, and praise the Lord, it has and does. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Even lying to your own self is what happens when we receive the word. We start to think that we're something special. We start to think that we're holy. We get very puffed up. This will ruin a man, and God hates it. He hates the lying tongue that says and does not. Verse 23, For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh unto the perfect law of liberty, whoso looketh instead of at what his face and his flesh behold, right? The man that looketh in the mirror is seeing himself. He is seeing his own reflection. He is seeing nothing but flesh and saying, you know, I look like a pretty good person. Walks the other way and forgetteth what manner of man he actually is. He has now the image in his mind of what is appeared on the outside. But, verse 25, contrasts this. It says, Whoso looketh unto the perfect law of liberty, looketh unto the Bible, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man's deed, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So instead of looking at a mirror and seeing my reflection in my flesh and everything that I think that I'm appearing to be to people on the outside, I take the Bible and use this as my mirror. And I reflect on the things contained within the scriptures. And this becomes the reflection of me. This becomes the portrayal of my heart. This exposes the truth of God. And there's no carnality. There's no flesh in here. In order to get rid of hypocrisy, we need to stop lying to ourselves and lying to our others and saying that we're something that we're not. We need to look to the Bible and let the Bible tell me what I am and walk in those truths. See, look into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein. That's where we get rid of hypocrisy, by looking at the Bible and continuing in the Bible. When you do that, you're not a forgetful here. In other words, you have walked the truth. When the Bible says, thou shalt not steal, you actually walk in that truth and don't steal. When the Bible says, thou shalt not covet, you actually walk into that truth. Stop looking at other people's possessions and wishing them upon yourself. When it says, thou shalt not bear false witness, when it says the lying tongue is abomination unto the Lord, you look to that truth and you stop lying because you know the Bible says not to do those things. But we already know that you can't just do those things in and of your own flesh. So what do you need to do? Day by day, moment by moment, say, God, my tongue is an unruly, evil, deadly poison. You take care of it. God, my tongue is deceitful and wicked and always wants to say the wrong thing. You take care of it. Handle and manage my tongue. I praise God you would do that. God, I am just constantly saying that I'm better than I actually am. Take my tongue and allow me to speak truth, your truth. Allow me to reflect on the law of liberty, continuing the law of liberty, that I wouldn't be forgetful of the things that you have taught me. And the Bible says here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. You want to be blessed in this life? Read the Bible, continue in the Bible, and work what the Bible teaches you. The Bible says in verse 26, If any man among you seem to be religious, he appears to be religious. You look at this person, and they've even said that they're an apostle. If you look at that person, they seem to be religious. They see him on the outward. That person has looked at themselves in the mirror. You've looked at the reflection that you see, and you see someone that is religious, someone that is upright, someone that is righteousness. But look at this. And bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. It is empty. There is nothing to the religion that is nothing but talking, nothing but appearance on the outside, nothing but what you would see when you look at a mirror, what you would hear from the mouth. The pure religion has actions to it. And that's what it continues when it says in verse 27, pure religion and undefiled for God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, to keep himself unspotted from the world. It has to do with working to help others. It has to do with keeping yourself separated and unspotted from the world. But too often we are the ones that are beholding ourselves in the mirror. We are the ones that have an unbridled tongue. We are the ones that are constantly yuppity, yuppity, yuppity about how great we are and how poor others are. 
and how wonderful it is to be Christian. We know all these great facts, but we don't actually apply these and walk these. We have and possess and use daily the fire, the world of iniquity, the unruly poisonous tongue, that lying tongue that the Lord says he hates. Christians, God forbid that it be so among us that we would possess and use all the time in our daily life a weapon that literally God hates. And we're in danger of that if we don't do what the Bible says and yield that member unto him as an instrument of unrighteousness and do the things that he teaches us through the scriptures. If we don't do these things, we have a vain religion, we're hypocrites, we're liars, and God hates the tongue that is within our mouths. Thank you, Father. I thank you for this.